Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum, the international congress that provides a platform for more than 1,500 media representatives and experts from the fields of politics, culture, business, development, and science. Welcome to Bonn, the UN city of Germany. These delegates design interdisciplinary approaches to meeting the challenges of global problems and explore how the media can play a central role in investigating and communicating solutions. The three-day conference program contains more than 50 panel discussions, workshops, interactive presentations, and exhibitions, as well as attractive leisure events in and around the World Conference Center in Bonn, Germany. It is great for me to be back uh, in Bonn. You feel a mission. In which we launch a one-year campaign. You get very, very useful information. Highlight uh, what is actually happening in this world. Between uh, journalist, advocacy and diplomacy. To actually push the issue rather than try and push themselves. The challenge is uh, the question of democracy and elections. Keep that alive and build a more stable and more transparent and accountable democracy. The so next time you must join us. Thank you. Each year, the conference focus is on a different issue related to media and development. In 2008, the conference theme was media and peace building and conflict prevention. In 2009, conflict prevention in the multimedia age. The topic in 2010, the heat is on, climate change and the media. 2011, human rights in a globalized world, challenges for the media. For the participants from more than 100 nations, the forum has offered excellent opportunities for conversation and exchange. As a result, an international network of experts has developed. Culture, education, media, shaping a sustainable world will be the topic of the upcoming conference in 2012. How can the media serve to enhance awareness of the essential importance of education for a sustainable development of our planet? Engage in our international network, be part of the solution to global issues, and become a member of the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum family. A very warm welcome to all of you. I see the attendance is a bit thin. Um, I think some of the people have already left. Some people are hoping to grab a bite to eat. And uh, I think some people are just tired because we've had three very stimulating days discussing education, discussing how education is a fundamental pillar for de uh, democracy and development in a sustainable world. Well, in this last and final plenary session of the Global Media Forum, we'll be looking at one very crucial aspect of education, quite literary, literally the fight for education. We're going to take a look at how you provide education, what kind of education in areas of conflict and in areas which are emerging from conflict and crises. Now, we'll be assessing the opportunities as well as the risks with the panel that we have here for you. Two of them come from multilateral organizations who've been working in areas of conflict to see the best programs which can be implemented there. We have two panelists who are from actual regions of conflict, and we have one person who's from education, but not an area of conflict, and he'll be sharing his perceptions with us. But first, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Conrad Schetter. He's working on a very important project on the fight for knowledge. He has done extensive work on conflict and governance, on violence and structures of power, on intervention and identity. So may I uh, invite uh, Dr. Conrad Schletter, who's from the Center of Development Research at Bonn University, to make a keynote address for this session. Dr. Schletter. Dear ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists, of course, for me, it's a great honor to open the last panel, The Fight for Knowledge, Opportunities and Risks of Educational Work in Conflict and Crisis Zones on this, let me say, very successful and stimulating global media forum. 
The forum this year addressed the topic of a sustainable world. I feel it goes without saying that knowledge, in particular the development of knowledge, plays an important role in reaching sustainability. Particular in post-conflict countries where societies have undergone dramatic changes and disruptions, education in generally is seen as a key to preventing new cycles of violence. The argument goes that formerly educated people are better able to distance themselves from their own position, reflect on it, and develop their own coping strategies, and hereby tend to be less violent than uneducated people. Against this background, my institute, the Center for Development Research of the University of Bonn, recently started a project which aims to scrutinize the role of higher education in post-conflict societies. As today's panel will discuss educational work in conflict and crisis zone on a more general level, let me formulate three issues with which we identified as important and which somehow ch challenge the general assumption that improved education directly leads to sustainable peace. I think we have here to differentiate much more. First, Educational, line, educational status as a line of conflict. Conflict research focuses usually on ethnic, religious, or economic fragmentations in societies. It is often forgotten hereby that one's level of education can also become a significant marker in violent conflicts. Perhaps the most prominent example is the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia uh, having a particular educational status, such as a teacher, professor, or even a Buddhist monk, translated directly into being, uh, the, in, into being conceptualized an enemy. For sure, Thierry Seng, who is with us on the panel, will tell us more about the role educational status might play in the Cambodian case and how related post-conflict challenges were addressed there. Second, as we know from the Balkan Wars, but also from many other conflicts across the world, highly educated actors, such as professors, teachers, but also engineers, can play a decisive role in conflict mobilization, both, both in the escalation as well as in the de-escalation of conflicts. Given the potential of, for pivotal involvement on the, far, on the uh, part of education, educated elites, destructive as well as constructive, the role of education in conflict as well as in post-conflict societies should, in my eyes, uh, be examined more in detail. I'm sure that, for example, Derek Carlson uh, can comment uh, on this topic uh, in this panel. Third, and I think this is the main uh, issue, ideology of, edu ideology of education. Higher education, but also education as such, easily becomes an arena for political contestations. This can be observed in more or less any post-conflict society anywhere in the world. Partisan politics have a strong influence on education. Questions such as which ideology becomes the dominant one? Uh, what has to be taught in school books? Or who will get a professorship in one university are often highly contested in post-conflict societies. Just to give you one example from Afghanistan, uh, where the question still is ongoing, if the university could, should be called in Pashtun, Pantu, Pantun, or in Persian Dari, as Danishka, uh, triggered again and again severe tensions on the campus of Kabul University. I'm sure that Ashraf Rani, who is with us, and he was a former chancellor of the Kabul University, will tell us more about this ideology of conflict. However, we have also to take the international perspective uh, into consideration. International donors uh, often understood education as a kind of a neutral government service, such as healthcare or transportation. Approaches to advancing education are often technical. Improvements to education are usually measured by the number of kids enrolled in schools or by the numbers of new schools built rather than by the quality of teaching? I think this is a tremendous question. Politically more sensitive dimensions of which, which disciplines and what kind of contents are taught are often neglected. 
I hope that uh, Francois Leclerc, who is with us, and uh, Mikhailo Milovanovic can shed light on political dilemmas inherent in improving post-conflict educational infrastructure. Just by starting with these three issues, I think, uh, on the one side, educational status as conf line of conflict, second, the role of high, higher, highly educated actors, and thirdly, the uh, ideology of education, I think further questions can be raised regarding the role of education in conflict and post-conflict situations. In my view, I like to close with a provo provocative argument that it is a misconception that education inherently leads to a more peaceful society. I feel that a fine-tuning is urgently needed to understand the impact of education a better way. From there, more relevant questions can be raised, such as how to bring about a change of mind, what should actually do, should be taught in schools and universities, how to overcome frictions and partisan politics within the teaching staff, and so on and so forth. I hope I could raise some stimulating questions to the panelists, and I'm sure that I will get some interesting response from the discussion. Before I hand over the, the floor to the panelists, I would like to thank Deutsche Welle for hosting, as well as the Thyssen Foundation for providing the funds to organize this panel. Both are very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Dr. Chetta, thank you very much for those very insightful comments. You've raised some very important issues, which I hope to now discuss with the panel. And let me introduce the panel to you now. We have on my extreme right, Francois Lecrec. He's a development economist and research officer with UNESCO, an organization which has done incredibly good work in trying to um, bring about programs for education in areas of conflict, crisis, and reconstruction. Uh, Thierry Seng, sitting next to him, is from Cambodia. She's been a victim of her country's terrible past. Uh, she has experienced in the early stages of her life the regime of Pol Pot. She left the country as a child and moved to the United States, became a lawyer, and then moved back to Cambodia and has now set up two organizations there. One is called Civicus, a center for civic education, and another which is the Center for Justice and Reconciliation. Next to me is uh, Mihailo Milanovanovic. Sorry, I have to say that again. Mihailo Milovanovic uh, from OECD. Now, he's done extensive work not just within uh, education policy within the OECD, but also partner countries at the OECD, countries which have experienced conflict or are in the process of emerging from conflict. On my left, I have uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani from Afghanistan. Um, Dr. Ghani is a man of many parts. He began his life as an academic and then became an international technocrat with the World Bank, uh, went back to Kabul and became the chancellor of Kabul University, then was finance minister under the government of Hamid Karzai and was at one point also a presidential candidate. Um, next to him, we have uh, Daryl Coulson, who is from the field of education, has spent most of his life working in the education field and is now the president of Wartburg College in the U.S. state of Iowa. And finally, you've already met uh, Dr. Shetta there. Now, um, we've raised a lot of interesting uh, questions here and heard uh, uh, Dr. Shetta talk about lots of things. Let me begin with you, Francois. Your um, organization brought out, did a global monitoring report last year, which they discussed armed conflict in education, which the report actually called a hidden crisis. There were some very startling statistics in this report, and one of them was that 40% of children out of school are in conflict affected regions. Give us a sense of some of the main findings briefly of your report. Yeah, actually, it's even more than 40 percent. It's 47 mm. percent. Uh, so almost half of all children who are not in primary school today live in just 30 countries, which are low and middle income countries affected by conflict. So this means that any major progress that is to be made uh, on a global level in terms of providing basic education to all children has to address uh, situations of uh, countries in conflict. Uh, and the changing nature of conflict, uh, conflicts today are mostly civil wars, um, in which most victims are civilians, um, some of them victims of uh, fightings, but others indirect victims of malnutrition, hunger, diseases. 
Uh, for instance, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, half of the five million people who died uh, over the past decade were children under five. And in those conflicts, routinely, uh, schools are being attacked. School buildings are destroyed or used as, uh, for military purposes. Teachers and children are killed, some children are raped or enrolled uh, in uh, armed forces. Um, and um, thousands and millions of people have to flee uh, either within their own country or across borders and find it very difficult to secure access to education for their children. Um, in education circles, uh, the importance of conflict is not taken into account uh, as it should. And amongst people who work in humanitarian aid and in peace building, the importance of education is neglected. Right, that is uh, very interesting. We'll be taking up some of those issues as why is education neglected. Thierry, now you live in Cambodia and your country, as we heard from Conrad, is one of the countries where people working in education were specifically targeted uh, under the Pol Pot regime. Um, now, you've gone back and you're actually trying to use education as a tool for reconciliation. Tell us a bit about your work and how successful it's been. Well, we have the Khmer Rouge Tribunal now, but before I begin and uh, talk a little bit about that as a catalyst for education opportunities and also risks, I would like to frame all my comments actually by saying that we Cambodians um, are subjects and we are survivors. We are trying to learn what it means to be citizens. We are not citizens. Um, we are subjects because of French colonialism, because of occupation, and because we live under a monarchy. So we have the mentality of a subject of a monologue. There's no talking back. And the Khmer Rouge made us survivors. And even the wealthy now in, um, in present-day Cambodia possess the mentality of a survivor. And uh, the mentality of, um, of a survivor is only living for the day. Um, like I said, even the wealthy who have the resources to think further cannot because they're blocked by the mentality of survivor. And so the challenge for us is how do we transform those mentalities of subject and survivor into a mentality of citizen? And I I'm simply define citizen as a person who knows her rights and not only knows her rights but exercises her rights. And the most important part, we have, uh, there's a lot of education done on, on that in terms of knowing our rights, but what is missing now in Cambodia is exercising those rights with responsibility. That's the other side of citizenship to me. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do right now, is how do we transform a whole society, the wealthy, the, the majority poor, the leaders from, um, from subject, from survivors into citizens. And my parents, um, for example, um, the Khmer Rouge occurred, the genocide occurred 30 something years ago, and um, both my parents were killed, and my, my father was targeted because he was a teacher. As you know, they targeted the educated class. Um, so it was a very political decision. It was a very targeted, intentional decision to, um, to erase the educated class. Thank you, Terry. Um, Mihalo, you have just come back from uh, Kyrgyzstan, um, and you have been working extensively in areas which have either slipped into conflict or just emerged out of conflict. What have been your observations vis-a-vis -vis education? It's a very good question. In a way, if one would try to talk about education and crisis, it's a little bit of a love-hate relationship, I have the feeling, because it's not very clear to what extent education can act as catalysts in provoking a crisis to what extent education actually is preserving the status quo. So very much like the, the question that was asked in the keynote um, about the impact of education when it comes to, to crisis. The OECD works with its members, but it also works with non-members. Um, so we had the chance to work in different places that uh, were, as you said, uh, slipped into conflict or just emerged from a conflict. And one thing is very interesting, it seems that the majority of countries I could think of where we had a chance to do policy analysis, the education systems are very slow. They're very conservative. They are, in a way, you know, the guardians of traditions. So basically, I mean, give, give an example also from my own background. I come from the eastern part of Europe, 
where the education system was extremely good in preserving the status quo, so the changes that came, they came like anything else from top down. So I can confirm it was very comfortable and very merciless. But then again, because of this traditional, very slow motion, education systems like in Kyrgyzstan or in Egypt, I'll mention this in a second, they fail to recognize what the needs of society are, that these needs have evolved. For example, in Kyrgyzstan, although it's written that in the constitution that in Kyrgyzstan there is Kyrgyz education with the Kyrgyz curriculum, most of the textbooks or the textbooks that they consider to be good come from Russia. There's nothing wrong about that. But what happened is that also the Russian schools, which are the minority schools, uh, were the best. So there was a large divergence in the quality of education provided in the country. Ultimately, this is one of the reasons why the country was almost split into half during the recent crisis. You had the South that didn't speak Russian, you had the North that spoke Russian. So this was a problem. In Egypt, it was a similar situation, a very slow motion system. Uh, that failed to provide an increasing numbers of young people with the skills needed to find a job. And you had to get said yesterday also in the panel that the OECD was, uh, in the workshop the OECD was uh, uh, moderating, that there's this toxic mix of employers that cannot find people that they need and you have people that don't have the skills needed by the employers. It's another example of what the contribution of education to a conflict situation might be. I have other examples as well, but in our preparation for the panel you started with, we should keep the time. So I'll stop. Yeah, I'm afraid because it's the last panel, I have to thank you very much for all of you who have come in since we've started this debate. We are looking at the opportunities and challenges of education and conflict areas. And I want to ask a question to someone who comes from a conflict area, Dr. Ashtav Ghani. You're in a very unique position because you've been an academic, you've been an international technocrat, you've also been in charge of policy in your country. Now, um, Conrad talked about uh, using schools as an ideological battleground where ideologies compete with each other. And Afghanistan's a good example. You had the Soviets who used schools to promote their ideology, then you had the Mujahideen, they had their own form of uh, um, indoctrination, and then finally you had the Taliban. And one of the you know, strongest things that they did is they didn't allow women to study. Now, from that experience, what do you see as the key ways that Afghanistan can use education to bring peace to the country? Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. First, the classic statement of a society in conflict is Germany after World War I. It's Max Weber that puts the problem of objectivity and advocacy. And you remember, he says, because you cannot guarantee freedom of exchange in German universities, consequently, you go towards neutrality. The United States was one of the most censored societies under, uh, under the McCarthy period. So this problem is not unique. We need to generalize the issue to the extent to which education becomes an instrument, depends on how education is governed. The governance of educational systems makes an immense difference. So it's not education per se, but how education is governed. And that is implications. Three, you know, in places like Afghanistan, Cambodia, a lot of these places, the question is, how do you overcome history? And there I want to build on Terry. Education is fundamentally two issues, it's a function. One, it is to produce citizens with a sense of rights and obligations. But two, it has to provide you with the capability to run a society, an economy, uh, and a polity. And within this, the balance between appreciating the past and overcoming it means that we have to take account of the present as both a rupture and a continuity. And in that regard, the first issue is the global aid system is in total crisis. The relevance of what they preach is really uh, close to horrible. Uh, UN agencies, the World Bank, and others, they embody certain types of outlook, but they cannot deliver. Two, human capital has become fundamental to running other forms of capital. In here, it's not about copying, but reinventing. Education as we know it is being reinvented. And the opportunity here is to take not the ugly side of globalization, but the good side of globalization. Namely, how we could connect through distance learning. So the modern communication becomes a mechanism of really bringing us together, because that question of skill 
and as well as the type of literacy. So to conclude, a place like Afghanistan has got immense complexity because you have to manage a number of things that are not routinized. In here, we require in these places a lot of thinking. In my last comment is, the word post-conflict is overdrawn. These are actually societies that continue to have substantial conflict. And by declaring that they're in a post-conflict situation, it's like post-modernity. Uh, what does it exactly mean? It's a state. It's a condition, not an end. Thank you, Dr. Ghani. Um, Daryl, you come from a, a university where we don't have conflict of the scale of the nature that we are talking about in this panel, but your university does offer a space for students who come from countries in crisis and conflict. Tell us about that. Well, ours is, uh, Wartburg Colleges is one of the uh, many liberal arts colleges that, are, uh, that exist in the United States. Uh, independent of the government, funded by, um, in most cases, uh, religious communities that immigrated to the United States in the uh, uh, 18th or 19th centuries. The mission of the institution is to prepare young people for lives as citizens who can contribute to communities, both through their work in the economy and through service in other ways, volunteerism and, and other techniques. So we speak always of lives of leadership and service as citizens. The kind of education we practice is, and this goes to uh, Dr. Shedder's point, is what we call liberal education. And that is, it goes back to that ancient Roman term, the original term uh, of, of education, educare, to lead out of. And the notion is that we're leading young people out of superstition, out of bias, out of uh, presupposition, into free exercise of their thoughts. Uh, a tactic we employ is to bring uh, international students from all over the world to spend time on our campus as matriculating students and to send our students as frequently as you can uh, to other parts of the world. So on our campus we have students from long-time conflict zo zones such as Palestine, uh, recent conflict zones such as uh, Bosnia and uh, Kosovo, and then uh, continuing uh, recent, uh, more recent conflict zones such as South Sudan, Congo, and Myanmar. Uh, it's important for those students to spend time on our campus with domestic students from the United States so that they can learn from one another. So we have students who would ordinarily not be spending time with one another in, other in their home countries, but they're spending time with one another on our campus. And it's this intent to break down barriers, to break down presuppositions and suspicions so that people can deal with one another uh, as they really are. Right. Th thank you, Daryl. Now, at this point, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Jana. Jana, if you stand up, she's our Twitter lady. Jana is, uh, does the news in German on uh, Deutsche Welle television, and she's be, uh, be, uh, taking your Twitter comments. I invite all members of the audience to actually make your comments. You've heard the initial opening remarks from all our panelists. Send your comments. Uh, we have the address there, which we don't. It's hashtag GMFDW. Is that correct? Uh, DWGMF, that's hash DWGMF. Send your comments during this session um, so that uh, you know, Jana can monitor them. And at some point in the session, we'll read out some of your comments. Uh, we would like you, in fact, very much to be part of this conversation and not just have uh, us people sitting here in the front uh, talking at you.